good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Um, today, we are delighted to bring you a webinar on the health benefits of cooking in season. Uh, in this session, we will cover the best seasonal foods to enjoy for optimal brain health, seasonal activities to maintain a healthy body, and we will end off with a demonstration on some simple seasonal recipes. And then at the very end, we will reserve about 10 minutes uh, to answer all of your questions. So I will just note, if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead. We've got a chat and a Q&A open. Pop your questions in there, and Rose will be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. <laughs> Uh, so again, to take you through this presentation and cooking demonstration, I am pleased to introduce you to Rose Reisman. Rose is an award-winning entrepreneur, caterer, author, and media personality, not to mention a mother of four. As a registered nutritional consultant armed with an MBA, she has a passion for healthy living and developed into a multifaceted uh, enterprise, making her one of Canada's leading authorities on the art of eating and living well. Rose is committed to changing eating habits of Canadians. She's a sought after speaker and spokesperson and has over 20 cookbooks under her belt that I'm sure you would enjoy. As I mentioned, as we move through the presentation food demonstration, please feel free to pop any questions you have into the chat. We look forward to hearing your questions and your comments. Now over to you, Rose. Thank you so much, Natasha. Pleasure to meet you. I wish I could see all of you, but this is our new technology. Um, I, I come from a background of food. I'm not a trained chef. I am a nutritionist, and I have learned to just love the world of food and more so healthy food. So for years, um, I ran a catering company called Rose Reisman's uh, Catering, and we had a kids' lunch program where we were serving 2,000 kids a day lunch. And that was really to start educating parents and children how to eat well. Personal Gourmet, a fresh and frozen food line that we delivered to people's doors. And we did events. So now I'm a consultant uh, with the company. I left about two years ago to pursue my other interests. And today what I want to talk to you about is, and we'll go to the next slide. Actually, that was what I do. The next slide. Thank you is enjoying seasonal foods and outdoor activities. So tis the season. This is a wonderful season. Anywhere really, I mean, depending on Canadian winter and springs and summers, from May till October usually is just a great time of year. You can eat well, uh, you, you can be active, and that also is going to end up turning you healthier. Next slide, please. So eating well and living well, what does that do? Well, we all know that ultimately the better you eat, exercise, you live well, we all know there's no guarantees in life, but it will by chances reduce the risk of serious conditions and diseases. Next slide. And what are the risks? Well, we all know the risks of serious conditions. We have heart and stroke disease, digestion, so that's IBS, might be diverticulitis. Um, uh, constipation is part of it. And then osteoporosis, as we age, our bones get weaker. Diabetes type two, obesity. And sometimes with obesity, we also look at those who are underweight. That can also be a critical condition. Various forms of cancer, dementia, and Alzheimer's. So can we prevent any of this? Well, we all know there's not a perfect world. We know that we can still get disease even if we live well, but we will reduce the risk. Next slide, please. So. In terms of seasonal fare, um, you know, why we want seasonal fare is that, believe it or not, you, we all know it tastes better. A tomato in the summer tastes better than the winter when it's coming across the border or traveling for miles. It's healthier because you're getting more nutrients immediately. The colors are vibrant. Everyone loves to look at summertime salads. And it is, even though food prices are up, I grant you that it's more economical in the summer. Next slide, please. So what we think about environmentally friendly, we're always thinking about the environment, especially my children and my children who have children now, my grandchildren will ultimately be really looking at this. Uh, we want to support local produce and farmers when we can, because that's being environmentally friendly. So in other words, when trucks are coming up from Florida or anywhere, California, the transportation alone really has concerns about our environment. And we're using so much more technology when we're importing our food. But we realize we live in a climate like Canada, we have to, but part of seasonal eating and living is that we can really reduce the environmental effect. Next slide, please. And we all know it tastes better. I mean, everything tastes better in the summer. We know that the tomatoes are better. And part of that is because when food travels that far, 
you don't realize there's a lot of technology involved. They have to be in refrigerated trucks. Then when they get here, if it's too cold, they have to warm them up. So you're constantly playing with a natural fruit. And by playing with it like that, you're changing the composition, which is going to ultimately affect the taste and the nutrition. Next slide. So where do we find local? Well, you know, for instance, today I went into my metro, which is in Ontario, and there's Foodland Ontario. So the minute I see a nice little sticker of Foodland Ontario, like I might have on some of my, my fruits and vegetables here, I know that it's been grown in Ontario, so I'm being more um, environmentally friendly. I'm helping the farmers. And if you live in BC, you'll see a logo called Eat, Drink, Buy BC. So this is one thing you can do, but also, Find out where your farmer's markets are. Find out some of the stores that go to the farmer's markets. That's how you can find local and really support the community and the environment. Next slide, please. Fresh fruits and vegetables. So I'm always asked, what's better, Rose, fresh or frozen? Okay, so part of this, it's interesting. In the summer, there's nothing nicer than fresh because chances are you're getting it just a few days away from being picked. But frozen, ultimately, believe it or not, is healthier and more nutritious, but doesn't taste as good. But once you get into November, I always tell people, buy some frozen vegetables and fruits because it's more nutritious. Fruit or vegetable is picked, it's flash frozen, and it's picked when it's ripe. Flash frozen, once it's flash frozen, it maintains those nutrients. So I would not worry about eating frozen and worrying about whether it's nutritious. Canned vegetables are another matter. That's where you lose a lot of nutrients. Often sodium is added. So I stay away from canned. Next slide. And how much should we have? I'm always asked, this, especially by people over 60, um, oh, I'm concerned about my sugar levels. What should I have? I'm going to say this, and maybe a doctor would disagree, but there's never too much of these superfoods you can eat. And I'll clarify that because I know someone out there who might be diabetic will think twice about that. But one serving is about a half a cup. So whenever you have half a cup of diced apple or fruit, that's one serving. So you can have as many as seven to 12 servings, which is about six cups of food a day. And often I'm just always nibbling at melon or berries and not even counting. So the next slide we'll discuss what happens if you have diabetes. Next slide. So here's the thing, you can eat fruits and you can eat more fruits when you have diabetes type two, but you wanna combine it with a healthy fat. So maybe that's um, peanut butter, olive oil, any kind of nuts, you want a healthy fat because those fats are gonna slow down the glucose absorption and prevent spikes. Now, there are certain fruits that you may want to avoid and that's gonna be the sweeter fruits like mangoes, pineapples, dried fruit, um, papayas, those foods have got more concentrated sugar and a diabetic may want to minimize that. Next slide, please. So some of the top summer foods, I mean, I have some just, you know, sitting out here on my counter. I mean, there's so many wonderful, wonderful fruits and vegetables that are all, you know, raised in Ontario or, or BC, but let's take a look at some of the ones that should be at the top of your list. Next slide. So we all hear about blueberries. I mean, everything from our mind sharpening our, our co cognition, but they have the highest levels of antioxidants. And that means good vitamins and minerals that ultimately can prevent certain cancers and also boost you with vitamin C. Uh, it's linked to better cardiovascular health, brain health, your immunity is stronger and your sugar levels stay more stable. And as I said, because of these antioxidants, this ultimately, the antioxidants can kill free radicals that can lead to different cancers. So enjoy berries as much as you can. If you can get the wild berries now, they're sensational. But frozen is also a great choice for blueberries. Next slide, please. Tomatoes, there's so many tomatoes out there now. I mean, there's heirloom, there's grape, there's cherry tomatoes and yellow tomatoes. Even though the yellow don't have the same flavor, they're not quite as sweet but they're a great source of vitamin C and potassium, and many of us have a lower potassium, also can fight heart disease, stroke, and memory loss. So throw it into your salads, cook with them, bake some fish with grape tomatoes, always a great addition. Next slide, please. 
and watermelon. So often I know diabetics will be concerned. My mother uh, who had diabetes, she was always saying, oh no, Rosie, I can't have watermelon. Watermelon is 92% water. It's filled with vitamins A and C, and it's actually great for hydrating. So if you're not a big water drinker, watermelon might be the answer. It can reduce the risk of cancer because of something called lycopenes in there. And also remember that buzzword I use, antioxidants. Next slide. And now apples, okay. The old saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It's fabulous. One of the key things about apples, why it's so good is the fiber. So the fiber one, it fills you up. So I know mid afternoon when I'm getting those snack urges, if I eat an apple, it really settles my hunger and I feel full. Now I know the chocolate bar or maybe McDonald's Sunday looks a lot better, but go for the apple. Um, it lowers cholesterol. It maintains your blood sugar levels. It has potassium, vitamin C, and is known to decrease blood pressure. And it may even reduce the risk of heart disease, cancer, and prevent, prevent weight gain. And here's something that you may not have known. The number one apple in terms of nutrition is Granny Smith. So enjoy apples and keep that saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Next slide, please. Red bell peppers. Now, this is something interesting. It's a richest source of vitamin C. So we always think orange juice. No, bell peppers have more vitamin C than any other fruit or vegetable. Um, one medium red bell pepper slice is providing 169% of the daily recommended vitamin C. So especially as we go into the cooler months and we need our immunity strong, enjoy those bell peppers. You can roast them, you can grill them. Just throw them over your salads or even uh, just have alongside sauteed with your proteins. Next slide, please. I'm now talking about the stone, the, the pits, right? The stone of fruits and vegetables. Cherries are wonderful. Anything you see with bright red, bright orange, bright green color is also always healthier for you. So when you look at, let's say an iceberg lettuce or even cucumber, it's a white flesh, not as many nutrients as these dark colored. So it's the antioxidants, again, that give it this red color. And this is known to reduce inflammation, which can lead to severe arthritis. And it also lowers your triglycerides so that your, your cholesterol stays uh, at a level. And it helps your sleep cycle because it has melatonin in it. And many of you may know you can take melatonin before you go to bed, but cherries naturally have this. So, you know, dessert at night, instead of hitting a granola bar, have a bowl of cherries. Next, next don't include our peaches. And today I'm making a peach salsa using a, a really nice Ontario ripe peach to put over my fish. So again, loads of fiber, vitamin C, B6, folate, potassium, and it's great for your blood pressure. It may prevent kidney stones and it improves digestion and bone loss. Next slide. Asparagus. I love asparagus. I always get a big batch of it. All I do is I put it at 450 degrees for about eight, 10 minutes. Don't overcook your asparagus. But again, look at the dark green color. It's high in lycopene, which was in the cherries and also in the tomatoes. It can reduce the risk of prostate cancer. It improves your immune system and it helps healthy gut. So a gut is where good bacteria is gathered, but we can get you know, a lack of good bacteria, which leads to digestive problems and also improves your immune system. Next slide. And corn, and I'm gonna be cooking with some corn today. And um, I love corn now, again, getting it at a farmer's market is the best. Uh, the key thing about corn that I'll talk about is don't overcook it. People tend to put it in tons of boiling water and cook it for 20 minutes. You're losing the nutrients. Believe it or not, people are, didn't know this. You can eat corn raw without digestive problems. It's fine. It does not have to be cooked. And it's actually incredibly crisp tasting when you have it raw. But when you do cook it, I suggest just an inch of water, uh, boil it or steam it for two minutes. Take out the zero, not 20 minutes. That's how you get the most nutrients and the sweetest flavor from the corn. So fiber lowers cholesterol, which is great. Sorry about that. Um, and also it protects vision from macular degeneration. Next slide. 
grapes. Okay, I love grapes, green, red. Um, you know, I know they smack your hand. My husband went in the other day to Metro and, and took one to taste and somebody yelled at him. Um, you're not supposed to do that, but ask, ask someone in the market if you can, because tasting before you buy is key with grapes to see that they're sweet. So red or green, they're both equal in terms of uh, great taste, but you wanna make sure they're really ripe and crisp. So again, tons of antioxidants can prevent cancer, improve blood pressure. And here's the thing I love to do. Maybe you've heard of it. If you want a great sugary snack at night, freeze a bunch of grapes that you know you may not eat uh, fresh. And at night I sit down to a small bowl of frozen grapes. It tastes like, like a, a delicious fruit popsicle, even like a gelato. It's really, really delicious. The sugar comes through beautifully. Next slide. So now getting away from some of our fruits and vegetables, we go to dark chocolate. And yes, we've all heard dark, dark chocolate, but I'm talking about 70% or higher. So if you just have the semi-sweet chocolate chips, which is about 55%, that's not gonna give you a lot of uh, vitamins and minerals, but a small amount can improve your heart health. And remember, small amount is emphasized, lower your blood pressure and um, even uh, prevent and decrease the risk of stroke in women by 20%. So that doesn't mean sitting down every night to a bowl of lint truffles. It means the semi-sweet chocolate in that nice bar, have a square of it every night before you go to bed. Rose says that's absolutely fine. And it all ultimately can protect brain health as well. Next. And Greek yogurt, one of my favorites. I eat Greek yogurt every day. Uh, Greek yogurt ultimately has a lot more protein than regular yogurt. Now, in terms of calcium, it has a little less calcium than regular yogurt, but one is I really think calcium is so important for us as we age, especially for our bones. And, you know, if we have a fall, we don't want to break something. But here's the key. The minute you buy the fruit flavored yogurts, you're adding sugar unnecessarily because it's not just strawberries added. It's strawberries and sugar or you're adding artificial sweeteners, which is not a good thing. So I urge you to get plain Greek yogurt. You may not love the taste, go for the higher fat, which is fine. Higher fat will have more protein, more calcium. Add your own fruit, and if you still want it sweeter, add a little bit of maple syrup or honey to it. Next slide. And salmon, getting into fish, and especially, you know, BC and Ontario, uh, you know, try to have fish that's in your area, especially this time of year. Um, this is an incredible fish. It's high in omega-3 fatty acids, which is going to ultimately reduce heart attacks and lower blood cholesterol and pressure. It's also great for build, building our brain cells. Um, organic or wild is better. Why? Because we all know that in today's lakes and oceans, we have mercury and PCB. So you want to be careful of those toxins, especially if you're eating salmon on a really regular basis. If you're eating salmon once a week, by all means, just buy regular because your organic can be more costly. And I know out in BC, if anyone's listening out there, you guys love your wild salmon. It's a very different texture and color, and it is delicious. Next slide. So what are some of the foods to avoid? We probably know this already, but let's look at the main culprits. Next, please. Um, avoid artificially sweetened sodas, juices, and coffee beverages. Honestly, you better add, it's better adding to your coffee a teaspoon of sugar than it is to have those chemicals on a daily basis. One of the reasons is that people often who are overweight tend to drink tons of Diet Coke, put tons of uh, sucralose into their coffee, diet drinks like crazy, diet juices, what happens is that, yes, you may be avoiding those 30 or 40 extra calories from, from some of the sugar, but what you're doing is your brain is still saying, I'm getting something sweet. When we eat something sweet, you know how hard it is to stop at one truffle. It tricks your brain into thinking, I'm getting sugar, I want more sugar. And that's often why I see overweight or obese people constantly drinking diet drinks they want more and more sugar, and ultimately that will lead to not just another Diet Coke, but will lead to a donut or more cookies or croissants. So beware of, of artificially, uh, um, sugar, artificially sweetened drinks, because I think that in the long run, it is not a good thing for your health. Next slide. And packaged foods. So, you know, when we think about salt, fat, and sugar, that's ultimately what packaged food is. 
Uh, most packaged food can increase your blood pressure. It's shocking to see the amount of sodium, your cholesterol from the saturated fat, your blood pressure, which ultimately leads to being overweight and can lead to diabetes type two and fatty liver disease. So does it mean you never buy packaged food? No, of course not, we all do. But anything you could make at home, always better for you. Or if you're gonna get a cereal, get a great brand cereal without all the extra you know, uh, candy literally put into these cereals. Next slide. And the new term today, uh, oh, we'll go on to that slide in a minute, frozen high sodium foods, some of the worst foods for you. People are always so nervous about having their salt shaker, which I actually forgot here for a minute, their salt shaker. They're afraid to add salt and say to me, Rose, I'm so proud at home because I don't cook with salt, but your food is gonna be pretty poor tasting. The sodium at home from that salt shaker is not what's getting you. That amount of salt that you probably add into your foods or over your, your dish is never gonna harm you or give you high blood pressure. What will is a frozen, or packaged foods. They have some of the highest sodium levels ever. And 75% of those who are over 60, statistics say they have high blood pressure. So any prepared foods, if you're constantly eating out of a box, take a look at the sodium levels, you'll be shocked. And 75% of the salt in our diet, as I say, comes from the process, not the salt shaker. So feel free to grind a little bit of that really nice pink or black or whatever color salts you want to use today. Next slide. And ultra processed food. So this is a new term. This just came out a few years ago. The millennials know all of this. The ultra processed foods are foods even beyond the packaged and, and the frozen. They're higher in calories, sugar, and fat dense. And so you see Pop-Tarts there. Um, even certain meats that are ultra processed, that they're no longer near what nature intended them to be. They contain very little nutrients, tons of preservatives, artificial colors, and nitrates. So these kind of foods, you'd rather have a boneless chicken breast that you've cooked at home or even bought at the supermarket in their, in their fresh prepared foods than you would for the sliced deli meats. Next slide. And what you want to do is always enjoy small, healthy snacks between meals. If you're starving, I know when I have lunch, might be 11 or 12, by four in the afternoon, I'm getting hungry. If you get hungry, it's almost too late. Whenever friends tell me they're hungry, they're famished, I know they're going to binge on something not healthy. Always consider a small, healthy snack between meals, even if you're not that hungry. It's going to stabilize your sugar level so you won't get tired, you won't fall into a low mood. Uh, it will curb your appetite and it will give you energy. And it can be anything from a piece of cheese to some yogurt and nuts, some veggies and hummus. Those are great snacks to have. Next slide. And make eating social. I love what's called breaking bread. And what that means is get out and join a friend, a family member, a group of people. Eating alone increases malnutrition. And I know when my husband, it's just my husband and I now living in our home, if he travels or he's away, I always say, oh, I don't want to bother to cook. It's easier to pop something in the microwave or just take a package meal that you bought at your supermarket and warm it up. But that ultimately can lead to malnutrition if you do that on a regular basis. And uh, social interaction is really the key to healthy living in general. Next slide. And eating a healthy, balanced diet. Well, we all know what that is, but people might say more, Rose, what exactly is a healthy, balanced diet? Well, I, I like the MIND diet, the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet. All these ones really talk about are having the right amount of lean protein. So it doesn't mean you have to be a vegetarian, but you want lean chicken, lean fish, lean beef is fine. You don't want the ribeye steaks on a regular basis, too fatty. Um, protein in terms of, of uh, animal protein, legumes, nuts, tofu, more of that introduces really a good thing. Another one is 100% whole grains. So if we can ditch the white bread or have it occasionally, whole grains, let it be a tortilla, an English muffin, um, uh, uh, really delicious whole grain bread is wonderful. Tons of fruits and vegetables. And dairy, you know, we're, we're lowering the amount of dairy in our diet, but good dairy like cheese, yogurt, kefir, these are good quality um, dairy products, but you can also go to plant-based like the almond milk, the oat milk. They're also excellent substitutions. 
Next slide. So you look at protein we've already mentioned, fish, eggs, nuts, but make sure you get some plant protein in there. It's very, very important. Um, also, you know, protein is not only important for your muscle mass and your bone health, but bone health is so crucial. I know occasionally in the woods with my dog, I fall. And I think I'm always lucky that I don't break something because I'm constantly looking at the amount of protein. And you should be having about seven to eight ounces of protein a day. It sounds like a lot, but that doesn't mean you should have an eight ounce steak once a day. It means between the nuts, between your chicken, your yogurt, that's all protein. That it should be about eight ounces. Next slide, please. And calcium. We all know calcium is key. We find it in dairy, in eggs, in cruciferous vegetables, sardines, soya beans, white beans. And it's very good, again, for bone health and prevents breaking bones. Next slide. B12. So we all hear about B12. If you're vegan or vegetarian, you might be lacking B12. So you should have a supplement that you can find it in milk, yogurt, eggs, beef, liver, um, bananas, and fortified cereals. And it really helps nerve function B12. That's why you hear about it being so important and keeps your red blood cells healthy, which protects against extreme fatigue and low energy. Next. And B6, and I know these are a lot of, you know, you might be taking multiple vitamin that has all of this, which is great. But if you have any of these conditions, you might want to look at an extra supplement. So basically B6 is good for preventing eye disease, which all of us start to have it as we age. Um, it, you know, what you find not only prevents eye disease, but it's also good for your immune system. You're going to find it in potatoes, sweet potatoes, liver, tuna, salmon, um, cereals, chicken, and chickpeas. So, so again, if you're eating a healthy diet, like the mind diet or the Mediterranean diet, you're getting these vitamins automatically. Next slide. And good old vitamin C. Well, we all know citrus. Um, and that doesn't mean drinking orange juice. Drinking orange juice is not a good habit. You're not getting the fiber. You're losing a lot of the nutrients. You want to eat a tangerine. You want to eat a real orange. That's what you want. And as we said about vitamin C before, bell peppers are high on the list, as you can see there. And what they do, vitamin C is great for incre increasing your white blood cell to fight infection. And we all need that, especially as we go into the winter season. Next slide. And vitamin D, that goes in hand in hand with calcium. It's important to absorb your calcium. You get it from the sunlight, which we get for a few months here, not, not that often. So it might be a supplement you look at in the winter. It's good for bone health, uh, cardio, also to prevent certain cancers, and um, specifically blood and colon cancer. And again, you find it in foods like tuna, orange juice, fortified, uh, juice, if you're going to drink any juice, beef, liver, and liver. And you need about 800 milligrams a day of that. Next slide. And magnesium, something again we hear a lot about. It helps maintain our mental health. And it also has a very calming effect. And you can see the foods there that you can get magnesium in. Next slide. Potassium, it's not just bananas. Potassium is also in your beans, in your dried fruit, in your potatoes, your sweet potatoes. This can help reduce high blood pressure, as we know, and reduces the risk of kidney stones. Next slide. And fiber. Well, fiber is number one to me. It reduces the risk of diabetes type 2 and heart disease. And all you have to consider is eating nuts, whole grains, um, sweet potatoes, we talked about apples, uh, quinoa or other grains and oatmeal, and you're going to get your full amount of fiber. And you need about 25 grams daily. And fiber will reduce the risk of diabetes type 2 and heart disease by keeping you full. Next slide. And keeping hydrated. So I know nobody wants to hear you have to drink six to eight glasses of water a day. It's very, very hard to do. But think about water coming in other ways. So what, we talk about watermelon, fruits and vegetables. I have lots of fruits and vegetables daily, a large salad every day. That constitutes a couple of cups of water right there. If you don't like drinking plain water, again, do me a favor. Those artificially sweetened drinks are not water. So that's, that will not count. Tea and coffee will count. 
towards your water intake. And also you could get the soda streams, which I absolutely love where you bubble the water yourself, club soda, um, Perrier, and people think at times that those drinks have sodium in it that might hurt you. No, there's such low amounts of sodium not to be concerned whatsoever. And some of the naturally flavored waters like Buble, Michael Buble came out with one called Buble or Bubbly. And that's great. It's just natural flavors and water that's bubbled. Next slide. So now we get into what we all love is exercise. And in this time of year, it's so much easier. Just going for a walk. I mean, I know every night I go out at seven o'clock with my dog for a walk. It's so enjoyable where you don't have to wear a heavy coat, but you might be into gardening, you know, planting flowers, um, maybe Pilates or yoga or working with resistance bands in your home or your apartment, um, or even just your body weight doing squats. It's important to do something every day. If you don't exercise now, Promise me you just start with five minutes of walking because as the winter hits, it gets harder. But now that COVID's more in the past, we can go back to these large malls and walk. But exercise does a lot of things. Let's look at the benefits. Next slide, please. The benefits are so incredible. It's um, lower heart disease. Your weight will be in more control. Diabetes type two can be avoided. If you fall, you'll probably survive a fall without breaking anything because you're more limber and your cognitive function improves when you exercise. So there is a 30% lower risk of developing dementia for those that exercise on a regular basis. Next slide. And maintaining a healthy weight. As we get older, it's tougher. I mean, I have to eat half, half today what I ate 30 years ago. But you know what? You're not always as hungry. By exercising more, you can increase your calorie intake. Was it a good thing? That's my reason for working out. Um, it's important for your health and your activity level. Many of us have either gone through knee replacements or hip replacements, often due to weight. So if you haven't lost the weight, it's harder to move around. And the less active you are, I really believe the less quality of life you have as you age. Next slide. Okay and the habits to avoid. So not getting enough sleep. Now sleep is a matter of personal concern, whatever works for you. Now you can't tell me that you can survive on three hours, but I think the minimum is six and maybe up to eight. People that oversleep nine, 10 hours is actually too much. You don't need that much sleep. Uh, routine is key in your life. I know that I feel mentally better and physically better when I have routine in my life. So setting up a routine as opposed to getting up and going, what shall I do today is really hard on you physically and mentally. And um, eating before going to bed, having frozen grapes or an apple is fine, but I'm talking about indulging in a pizza is not a good thing. It will affect your sleep, give you indigestion, not a good thing and you wake up with that food hangover the next day. And a poor diet, we've talked about that already, not a good thing. And excessive alcohol also affects brain health. So keep these in mind. Next slide, please. And activity and social interaction and good eating is really the magic bullet to a healthier life. As I say again, you know what? There are no guarantees that we all know in this life. You can do everything right and something still health-wise can happen to you. But you know what? You have better odds. It's like being in Las Vegas. You're going to win at that table more the more you end up doing the right things. And it all all of this increases your brain health, which is something we all, all want to hold on to. Next slide. And you can always find me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or do it all. Oh my goodness, it's, it's, my mother used to say, it is a different world. So hopefully you've learned something and, and happy to answer any questions in a few minutes. But if we have time now, Natasha, I'll look at what we prepared here. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Rose. That was super informative. I feel like I've already learned a ton. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and start your presentation, thank you everyone who's already popped the questions into the Q&A. I see a few are there. So as we go through, continue to pop in more. And as soon as Rose is done, we'll go ahead and answer those questions for you. So over Thanks. to you, Rose. And you know, I always say, if you can promise me that there was one thing you learned today, you can tell me what it is later, something you didn't know, because every day, I'm constantly reading 20 to 30 newsletters a day. And every day I learn something new that I like to teach people. So if there's anything today you learned, let me know, because that always means a lot. And if you only walked away with one thing, that's 
Perfect. All right, so what I'm going to do today is a really nice fish, and I bought a rainbow trout. So I'll show you this under our camera. Beautiful rainbow trout. You can get lake trout, but I bought a really nice Ontario fish, and you see I have a head of corn in there. So as opposed to standing outside at the barbecue, I'm kind of lazy like that. When I stand at the barbecue, I can't do anything else, and I like to multitask. So I can have this on my grill pan. This is a really great grill pan. You can buy them at Canadian Tire or anywhere that if you don't want to just bake your fish, because that might be a little boring to you, you can grill it like this and just flip it over. So I've grilled some fish. This fish took all of about six to seven minutes to cook. I even grilled or you could broil my corn. So it looks exactly like I took it off the barbecue. So my attitude is I don't want to waste a lot of time when I'm cooking. I have 10 other things I want to do. So putting it in the oven, the corn, or on this grill pan, I can walk away for 10 minutes. And it began easy. I mean, you can use frozen corn during the winter, which is great, but fresh corn is so fabulous. So again, you have different ways that you can take it. I just put it, you know, on its end like this, easily slice off the niblets. And any niblets you want, you can just take and freeze if you haven't used them. But throwing this into a salad, you've never tasted corn so good when you just grill it up, barbecue it, whatever you want, and throw it into a salad or have it as a side dish. It does not need to be soaked with tons of butter. And as I say, um, it's important that when you cook corn, you undercook it. And I know at times we all tend to overcook our vegetables, but really undercooking will save you the nutrients and in the end will taste a lot better. So with this, I decided to make a salsa. So I've got my fish grilling, which is gonna take seven minutes. I've taken a peach, diced it up, and I left on the skin because the skin is where the fiber is. If you wanna remove the skin by all means. So this is a fresh peach salsa using our beautiful uh, Ontario peaches. And you could use plums, you could use nectarines, you could really, I mean, honestly, you could use watermelon, any fruit, but a fruit salsa is usually really nice. Um, I've got some of our grilled corn that I'm gonna throw in. The corn nibbles are really lovely, very simple. And you can honestly add in any other vegetable you want. Some bell peppers from Ontario. Okay, sorry I'm not living in BC right now. Um, some black beans, I just like beans in my salsa. You could put chickpeas in or white beans, but I like the color of this. And then I'm just going to add in some freshly uh, minced garlic, which I really love. And I'm going to get some salt out for a minute and then a little bit of oil. I'm talking like maybe two tablespoons or three tablespoons. That's about it. And then I've got some fresh mint that I grow in my garden. You could use fresh basil if you want, but mint has got such a beautiful um, flavor this time of year. And just chop it up. Basil, you could use cilantro. You could use parsley as well. Even though I find parsley doesn't have that much flavor, but a little bit of mint really brings this to life. Some green onions. And again, it could be red onions. You could skip out the onions if you want. And then um, some fresh lemon juice. And I will go over just to get my salt for a minute because I like to add a little bit of a pink Himalayan salt to this, but any salt you want. But that's where I'm saying salt is absolutely fine to add once you've um, not used packaged or processed food. So give me one second while I find my salt. Okay, so I have my salt here that I just get at Costco or wherever. It's, it's a pink salt. It's really reasonably priced. I like the Himalayan. Now watch, that's about how much salt I'm going to use. And it's better to use um, a chunky salt like, like this as opposed to table salt. Does it have less sodium? People assume it does. It doesn't but it goes a much longer way. So you use less for more, all right? And then all you're gonna do is mix this up. You're always smart to taste it for seasoning. So I've made up enough now for probably double this amount of fish, but I'll show you how we're going to garnish this up. So really simple. You could do this with a piece of chicken as well. I'm gonna serve it up just with some fresh Ontario green beans. Now this might be a lot, this for sure would serve two people. I've got my salsa here. And then what I would do is I would take a little bit of salsa, 
just put it over top like that. Look how beautiful that looks. And again, substitute any fruit or vegetable you want. Okay, look how really nice and colorful that is. And remember I talked about color. Color is so important. And then I would always serve a little extra salsa because the salsa is so good for you that you would want to have more of it on the side and having it with some beans. And then of course, serve it maybe with a brown rice or a quinoa if you want, but you know what? You've got a lot of fiber in these fruits and vegetables. And then you end up having a gorgeous plate like this. We can uh, just do up a little piece of lemon to show you if you really want to have fun and be a little Martha Stewart like here. We'll cut up just one lemon like this, a nice wedge, and maybe just put it over like that. And you end up having a gorgeous dish that you might enjoy with a friend. And if this is too much, you would just have half of it and have it tomorrow. So I think that looks beautiful. It's fresh. We're using um, our, our produce, so we're saving the environment and helping the local farmers. And it's a great, delicious meal. And that's something I'm probably going to have for dinner tonight. So love to open it up to any questions you have. And I hope you do have questions because I'd like to answer any concerns. Great. Thanks, Rose. That looks delicious. I wish I was coming over for yeah. dinner. <laughs> um, so we do have quite a few questions, actually. So I'll great. go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, first question here is, I was told by a doctor that frozen food was starting to go and you said it was flash frozen. Is there a way that you can tell? Oh, okay. So once you, you're going to, yes, if it's starting to deteriorate, you're going to see ice crystals all over it and the flavor is going to be gone. Nutritionally, it'll probably start to suffer too. So I wouldn't buy tons and tons. Like if you're a Costco shopper, those bags are huge and you don't use them. Now, people that do smoothies every day, they probably want to buy those. But I don't use a frozen food that often, except occasionally for a sauce or maybe an oatmeal. So you want to make sure that after you open it, you, you uh, put it back into a, either a large baggie, freeze it well. And once you find it has freezer burn on it, it's probably time to toss. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Margaret would like to know, when talking about apples, there are so many new ones that have come to the market, but some are equal to others, or are there some that should be considered better than others? Well, like I said, Granny Smith is rated number one, but honestly, almost all apples are very similar nutritionally. There's one thing that you want to be careful of, and apples are at the top of the dirty dozen. What that means is that every year, uh, Ontario and different provinces come out with their clean 15 that are healthy to eat, that have the least um, preservatives and uh, not preservatives, sorry, the least, um, the least that are sprayed and those that are more sprayed. Apples tends to be at the top of the list. So what do I recommend? If you eat apples seven days a week or 14 times a week, you've got to pay the price and buy organic. If you have an apple, occasionally buy, buy the ones that are regular. I eat apples seven days a week, so that's the only fruit that I buy organic. So that's the only thing to be concerned about, that they do have pesticides and they're at the top of the list. That's the bad news. That's great. I think you actually started to answer the, the next question in here, which Lynn was wondering whether or not apples should be peeled. Many seem waxy and they also worry about the chemicals that keep worms oh. away. So do not worry, the chemicals, I hate to tell you again, the bad news, I'm, don't shoot the messenger. Uh, the apples, the pesticides penetrate the apple. If we could just wash away the pesticides, we'd be great, you can't. But wash your fruit well, you don't need to have those soapy washes, you can wash it well with water, pat it dry, but the fiber is so much in the skin. So I urge you to eat the skin. If you're gonna buy regular fruit and vegetables, the pesticides are in there no matter whether you peel it or not, except for the thicker skin. So when you deal with squash or watermelon, that doesn't penetrate the, the flesh. Great, that's uh, very informative. Jan is wondering, what is a good healthy snack for someone who is diabetic when on a bus trip and refrigeration is not available besides okay. fruit? So um, have some hummus, have some whole grain crackers, have some, uh, if you can buy those Bonnie Bell cheeses, that's fine. And I mean, because the, the buses are air conditioned, I'm sure in the summer. Um, so hummus, crudite, vegetables, um, crackers, uh, fruit is always great. Um, nut butter rolled up in, you know, or, or put on a hundred percent whole grain bread is great. Great. Lots of good suggestions. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, Margaret is also wondering what has happened to lima beans. I used to find them in the frozen section of stores, but now I can't find them except in cans in the ethnic goods aisle. 
Do you have any insight? You know, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but it must mean that it's being imported from far away and it's costing too much to bring in fresh. But that's a very good point. I will look into that. People don't eat lima beans the way they used to. Great, thank you. Um, and I will answer the next question from Veronica, who's wondering if, if um, she can get a copy of the recording, please, because lots of great tips. So uh, yes, anyone who's registered for the webinar will receive a follow-up email with a link to go ahead and uh, go to a site and get access to the recording. So thanks for asking that question. Um, next, Janice would like to know, what is good to prevent gallstones? Okay, so key thing really are, are fatty foods and excess sugar. So I remember a young girl I worked with, 27 years old, she was quite overweight, terrible eater, and she was so young suffering gallstones. And her doctor ultimately told her to cut the sugar and the saturated fat, not the healthy fat. So one is to look at what your diet is and also the amount of fatty red meat you're eating is key. So again, the cleaner the diet, the better for virtually so many illnesses and chronic diseases. Great. Um, and Aviva has a few great questions here. So the first one is butter or olive oil, what's healthier to cook with? Okay, so if you're sautéing, I'm not sure, ask her, yeah, oh, I don't know if she can answer this. If you're cooking at a very high heat, you don't wanna use um, olive oil because olive oil at a high heat breaks down. So you wanna use better another oil, like an organic canola oil, a grape oil, or a peanut oil. Butter is a natural ingredient, so butter is wonderful to use. But if you have high cholesterol, you wanna avoid butter. So butter is to be used to me in moderation. I no longer cook with a butter, a cup of butter in my cakes because my whole family had heart disease. So I always say olive oil is great and you can use olive oil in your baking and it's absolutely delicious. Great, thank you. Uh, another question here is milk. Um, as we age, do we need to drink milk more or less or not at all? No, you don't need milk. You need calcium, you need vitamin D. But what I like about milk or yogurt, I'd rather have the yogurt because you get more protein. Um, milk is not necessary but calcium is. So see where you're getting your calcium from. A lot of people live without milk and go to plant milks. So milk is not a necessity. And no longer in Canada's food guide, I wrote a book on, um, on the latest Canada's food guide, milk is no longer even a category. So we're really talking more about uh, the vitamins and minerals we find in these foods. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, and then another question here from Aviva, uh, tell us more about salt. There's so many wonderful new and fancy salts out there. What's better to use? Okay, so first of all, you want to read what the milligrams of sodium is. So basically, I believe 1,500 milligrams of salt is half a teaspoon total. That means that's all you should be allowed in your day. So when I look at a frozen meal and it says 1,000 milligrams of salt, and I eat that whole frozen meal, I've already had over three quarters of my salt intake for the day. So the key thing is there's fancy salts out there. Read what the sodium is and how much is in there. So here for a quarter of a teaspoon, there's about 500 milligrams of sodium in a quarter of a teaspoon. So you saw what I sprinkled over there. That was nothing, that was like just a pinch. But how much salt are you really eating in your day? So read the sodium and ask yourself, how much salt am I actually intaking in my day? Are you eating again, a lot of canned? frozen like hungry man foods or those frozen dinners those um you know weight loss dinners that's where the sodium culprit is great and just to add to that then do you have a preferred i saw you have pink himalayan salt do you have a preferred fancy salt or anything that you like most with your cooking i really love the pink salt maybe it's just the color that sells me but the pink is beautiful really affordable believe it or not you can even get it at dollarama for for next to nothing like for three dollars but I love the flavor of this salt. There's many different salts that you can try and experiment with. I use so little of this and everything bursts with flavor. And I'm never, and people think, oh my good, Rose, are you over salting your foods? Not at all. It's the flavor of these large chunks that are ground, which is so nice. Great, thank you. Uh, Maureen has a comment and a question. She said, wonderful presentation. Where can I find your salsa recipe? Oh, if you want, Natasha, I'm happy to email that to you and then you can send it out or put it on your website. Great. Thanks, Rose. Uh, next here, uh, again from Aviva, 
a rainbow trout or salmon, which one is healthier? Probably the rainbow trout, unless you buy organic salmon. You're going to have a lot less um, pesticides, not pesticides, you're going to have a lot less mercury, no mercury PCBs in the trout than you will the salmon because it's farm raised and we use so much of it. So again, if you eat a lot of salmon, but remember, let's take everything in context. If I eat salmon once or twice a week, the health benefits of eating the salmon once or twice a week will outweigh the PCBs or the mercury I'm ingesting. If like people that eat sashimi or raw tuna, I have had a friend that was a marathon runner. He ate sashimi seven days a week. He ultimately got mercury poisoning, but nobody's doing that today, right? You're not eating salmon seven days a week. If you are, because you love it, then you've got to bow down and say, okay, for my health, I'm going to buy the organic, which tends to be quite costly. Great. Thank you for that tip. Um, and Jan just says, thank you for the tip on buying organic organic apples and combining fruit with healthy fats for diabetics. So, That's great. Thank you. Uh, next here, um, uh, there was a question here about how we talked a little bit about gallstones. So same question, but what are some things you can do with your diet to uh, prevent kidney stones? Uh, kidney stones are funny. Sometimes you don't know where they come. Again, it's been related to a higher salt diet, poor diet uh, in general. Um, you know, the key is if you can get an ultrasound every couple of years, just to look at your organs to see if there's anything that you may be aware of. Um, I think, again, a healthy diet, watching your salt and your saturated fat is key. Great. Um, and Karina... Katrina, sorry, has a question here. Any thoughts on monk fruit sweetener? Okay, so monk fruit, I, I just actually did a story on Instagram on that. And if you want to follow me, it's just at Rose Reisman. Monk fruit is a natural sweetener, but you have to be careful. When you buy monk fruit, usually they do not sell it pure because it's just too potent. So they mix it with either a stevia extract or um, it might be um, uh, a liquid sugar, um, erythritol. So look to see what it contains. It's absolutely better for you than uh, twins or the other um, uh, aspartame. It's better for you than that. So monk fruit is a good suggestion, but don't think you're getting pure monk fruit. Usually you aren't. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and Barbara has a question is, what is the ratio for butter to oil and baking? Is it cup for cup? For my baking, because I don't use a cup, I use exactly the same amount. So every one of my recipes in my 21 books now always use oil, and I would use the same amount of oil to butter. Now, if you're having to beat your eggs and butter to make it very, very thick, then you and you need it to beat to a certain volume, you have to use butter, not oil. Great. And just uh, a question of mine popping in there. Thoughts on um, substituting coconut oil for um, different fats in your baking? Okay. So very good question, because I'd say about five years ago when coconut oil really came out, my daughter, my oldest daughter, who is really into coconut um, oil, said to use it for everything. Now, it's definitely um, a saturated fat. Let's not forget that. And they said because it had short fatty acids that it would ultimately would prevent heart disease, and prevent uh, cholesterol. Studies today show that if you're prone to having high cholesterol or heart uh, problems, it is not a good thing to have coconut oil. So this is the latest studies like five years later. So I was using coconut oil because my daughter said, mom, like, get with it. This is what you should be using. And then the studies now have come out to say they are concerned that these medium fatty acid chains are no longer as healthy for you as they thought they were. So remember, news comes out, it's like hitting, you know, CNN, breaking news, and we all go buy coconut oil. Now they're saying, take a step back, especially if you have heart issues or high cholesterol or high triglycerides. Fantastic information for me to know. Thank you. Um, and then Lynn just has a comment here, uh, I think going on to someone's question about uh, lima beans. Uh, she says, I've frozen lima beans, green giant valley section, Canada A, 300 grams. <laughs> I'm Great. Not sure advertising, uh, but uh, yeah. I guess just saying that they are out there uh, and maybe to look for the green giant. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll find out in the Josh, I'll find out why they're no longer available fresh. It must be uh, uh, an importing problem for sure. 
Great. Um, okay, so as of this moment, uh, we still have a few more minutes. Uh, we have answered all the questions, so maybe I'll just give it another minute in case anyone else has anything else. Um, but in the meantime, uh, as Rose mentioned, um, she has lots of information on all of her various channels, which uh, you can go ahead and check out. I know I'll definitely start following those pages as well because everything here looked fantastic. Excellent. Great. Yeah, let me know. You can always put in the question now or let me know what you learned today. That's always interesting to me to find out what you learned. Great. And, and as I mentioned, um, anyone who did register for the webinar will get a copy uh, of the recording through Access uh, as a follow-up to uh, this webinar. So oh, one more. Will the presentation also be available? Uh, good question. Let me just, I'll confirm. I'm not sure if it's something that uh, is shared. I know it's uh, live throughout the presentation, um, but uh, you'll definitely get a follow-up email for sure. And if you have any questions, you can respond to that email. We'll, we'll get back to you. So um, that I think is it for now for the questions. So thank you so much, Rose, for your time. Um, you. Very, very informative session, great recipes. And um, I know what I'm making for dinner tonight. So thank you so much for the idea. Oh, one more question. Does gluten cause bloating? What's that? Does gluten cause bloating? Um, you know, if you have digestive issues now, IBS or gastritis, it can, but I find that um, for me, gluten, crackers, breads actually help my, my stomach. But if you have, you know, Crohn's or colitis, you, you know, ultimately you, you have to stay away from gluten. So too much gluten absolutely will, will bloat you, but so will, so does rice as well. So Great. And someone else added in that they also love a good granny soap apple. So thanks for letting us know how nutritious they are. Great. Um, Excellent. And that's it. So again, thank you so much for your time, um, Rose. And thank you everyone who took the time to join us uh, for the session. Uh, stay tuned for a follow-up email. And uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you, everyone. Have, Have a great day. day. Hope it's not right. Bye-bye.